Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So today we are praying the Wednesday Eve of the Holy Pascha. So if we try to remember what we've had so far, uh, if we started on Saturday, we saw the miracle of the raising of Lazarus uh, from the dead after he's been dead for four days. And then on the same day, on Saturday night, we saw a big feast. It was made by Martha and Mariam, the sisters of the Lazarus who was dead and was raised. And then they all gathered, so the Jews came to see what was happening. Came to see this man who was dead for four days. He was dead and buried for four days. And then he, uh, he found, people found him alive again. So it was really strange. So all the people came. And the Jews, the scribes and the Pharisees were really, um, really upset because this miracle was really a very clear evidence of the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they started to plot against our Lord Jesus and they started to plot also against Lazarus to kill the evidence that he was alive after he was dead. Next day, the Sunday, our Lord Jesus enters Jerusalem and as he enters Jerusalem, people receive him as a king, as a victorious king coming to the city. They looked for a victorious king to come on top of a horse as if he is really a strong and uh, very uh, big royalty. But they found this humble person coming on a little donkey. So they all received him with joy. Then on Monday yesterday, we saw our Lord Jesus passing by the fig tree and then cursing that fig tree because it was showing that it had fruits and then it had nothing. It was showing the leaves and that's usually a sign of bearing fruits. But there was no fruits there. So our Lord Jesus was cursing that tree because of hypocrisy. So sometimes we really do the same thing, that we look to in front of the people that we are good people, we are righteous people, go to church all the time, and maybe deacons and servants. But when it comes to the test, we sometimes make big mistakes. So we have to be very careful. Our Lord Jesus doesn't like hypocrisy. He cursed that tree because it was doing that exactly the same thing. And then today we see our Lord Jesus in the morning talking to the Jews, doing a lot of discussions, talking to them about parables, about the heaven, the kingdom of heaven. So a lot of parables came today, the parable about the, uh, the second coming of our Lord Jesus. So we saw this vineyard that our Lord Jesus came to uh, give it to some people to work in it. And then at the time of paying the rent in the form of some of these grapes there, they did nothing. They paid nothing. So the owner of the vineyard would send them some um, people to say, OK, well, time to pay. Where is, where is your rent? So they paid nothing and they started to torture these people and they killed some of them. So he said, I will send my son. They would fear him. But what they did, that they found that, oh, they said, this is the, the one who's going to inherit that. So let's kill him. So they took him outside and killed the son of the owner of the vineyard. Our Lord Jesus gave many more other examples there. He started to talk about the second coming. In the morning, we had an hour when the gospel was the chapter 24 of the Gospel of St. Matthew, which was talking about the second coming of our Lord Jesus. So the disciples gathered around our Lord and asked him, can you tell us how it's going to happen? What will be there? What are the signs? And he started to tell them exactly what will happen. And he told them all the signs of his second coming. We see also in the morning the story of the flood of Noah. And the story of the flood of Noah was a scary story because we know that God was like patient and merciful and leaving people to do whatever they want. And the, he was bearing up with them. He was, he was waiting and waiting to see if these people would get better. But they were doing the opposite. They were getting worse. So he started to give them a warning. He said to them, I will send the flood. And he, he sent the flood in a, in a very heavy way. So the rains were for 40 days and 40 nights. 
And we hear in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, that the water covered the face of the earth and even went higher and higher and higher until it covered all the tips of the mountains. So if you, if you know that the Mount Everest, how high is Mount Everest? Hmm? Does anyone know? 8,000 feet. 8, feet, no more. 12,000 hmm? meters. Yeah, about 12,000 meters. So it's something like 11, 12 kilometers up in the air. And you can, can you imagine how much water would take to cover the whole earth for that height? It would be really a lot of water. And all this water was on earth, on the face of the earth. So people probably saw this water coming. Maybe first day they heard, ah, oh, it's raining tonight. And then they said, ah, oh, okay, well, it would stop like every time. And then next morning it's still raining. So can you imagine what will happen? Ah, well, water started to collect on the floor. Oh, I will raise the bed. And then the next day, our water is like a meter high. Okay, I will put my bed on top of the house. Okay? And then, the next day, the water is even higher than the house. So people started to flee, to go up on the mountains. And then up on the mountains, they thought that it's going to stop. And as the water creeps up, they will creep up towards the tip of the mountain, up until there's no way to go. Hmm? They all drowned. And no one would feel that they've done mistakes. No one would feel regret. They, they would still resisting the idea of Noah. They probably all saw Noah building up the ark. They all saw him gathering all the wood and putting it all together. We probably all saw some movies about that. They're very nice movies. And we see the people mocking him, laughing at him. What are you doing? You're building a big ark in the middle of nowhere? If you're going to build an ark, go and build it next to the seashore so that you can take it to the water. So everyone would laugh, was laughing at him. <coughs> and then he continued and continued building the ark until he made that big ark and he all got all these animals and birds inside. And then when the water started to come, they all went inside. Noah and his three children and their wives. So a total of eight people went inside. And then the water started to come heavily and then cover the face of the earth. And no one would repent. No one would call on Noah and say, can you take us with you? Sometimes we do the same thing. Sometimes we know that we're going in the wrong direction. But because of our own pride, they don't want to admit mistake. They don't, we don't want to say, I'm sorry. We don't want to say, can I agree with you after I objected to you? That's very hard because of our own pride. If these people did that, they would have jumped in. And any person would have jumped inside the ark would have been saved. Have you ever thought why we build a church in the form of a rectangular thing? Why? Hmm? Does anyone know? Giovanni. Because exactly, because it looks like the ark. Outside of the ark, they, they got drowned. Exactly. So we built the church in the shape of the ark, because or in a rectangular shape to look like the ark, because we know that people who are inside the church are the people who can be saved. If you sometimes decide to go out and stay out, know exactly that you are like those people who are outside the ark. If the rain comes, the flood of the world comes, you're not safe, you're not protected. And that's why the church gives us these teachings that we look and learn a lesson and follow. When God, we describe God all the time by being merciful, which is all well and good. And we all like to think that he's merciful all the way. It's fantastic. I love the idea of a merciful God. But you have to understand this merciful God is also just. And if he is complete in his mercy, he is perfect in his mercy. He is also perfect in his justice. He is perfect in his justice. So never ever think that God is merciful full stop. He is got the two characters together. And he wouldn't like to fall under his wrath. He wouldn't like to fall under his justice. Let's think about his mercy all the time. 
but let's remember that he is also just. It's very important to remember that he is just. We had also many parables about the second coming of our Lord Jesus. On the readings and the prophecies, we hear about the master who gives talents, talents to his servants. And the, one of the servants had five talents, and he was clever. He took the five talents, and he traded with them, he did a lot of work with them, and then he earned another five talents on top of them. So the total he had, he started with five, he earned five, he has got ten. So what's his profit in percentage? Come on, wake up. Don't like sleeping people. 100%. So he gained 100% profit. What about the, uh, the second guy? The second guy had two talents, and he earned also two talents after his hard work. So what's his profit? 100% again. But the third guy had one talent and did nothing with it, just hid it in the ground, and then he turned it back the same one talent. So how much is his profit? Yeah. Hmm? Someone is saying sifr, yes. It's a zero percent, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's zero percent. So the first and second guy got the same interest, got the same profit, 100% of what they started with. The third guy had zero. And if it was zero and full stop, would have been maybe acceptable. But he also had a very strong language he had. So he came back to the master. Let's remember the first guy first. Came with his first five talents and the profit of another five talents and said to the master, here, here we go, we've got this profit. And the master said, that's excellent, come inside and inherit the kingdom of heaven. The second guy with the two, two talents and two talents profit came and received the same, uh, hear the same words. But the third guy came to the master and said, here, here we go, you've got this one talent, you give me one talent, I give it back to you, because I know that you are a harsh master. You earn from what you have not reaped, or, or from what, you've, what you haven't worked for. So this, this servant was really, not really feeling guilty about what he's done. He felt that this is what he should give back. So the master said to him, you knew that I'm hard? Okay. Well, I will show you. So you should be cast out. All right? So let's ask a question here. Why the master was not merciful with the third guy? We always think that God is merciful. Yes, he is. But he is not only merciful. He is merciful and just. And when it comes to applying rules, God sets the rules. And as he sets the rules, he also respects the rules that he sets. So we have to understand that. It's good to live in God's mercy, but at the same time, you have to remember that He is just. It's very important to remember that part, because we tend to miss it in the busy life, and we all depend on God's mercy and say, I will just go and do whatever I want to do, and then I'll come back to God and He's merciful. Well, good, yeah, God is merciful. I, I haven't changed that idea. But don't put yourself under His justice. Because if you stay like that, you're abusing God's love. You're abusing His mercy. You have to be careful. If you know that you can stop yourself making this mistake, please do. Don't put yourself under this, this justice. Because it's, it's very fearful to fall in the hands of the fearful God. And then God keeps talking about the parables of the second coming. And he had a long discussion with them. In the morning on the 11th hour, the last gospel of the morning hours, we had this news that God, or our Lord Jesus, will be handed over to the hands of the Jews, and he will be crucified. And that would, will happen after a couple of days. And that's why the church, church says loudly a beautiful psalm. The psalm of Pekathronos. Pekathronos, which means, your throne, O God. So we say to God, our Lord Jesus, we say to him, yes, the people are plotting against you. The people are trying to kill you. But we put you higher up. We put you as our God. You are sitting on the throne. We all standing before you as your children. And that's a beautiful psalm that, that's said in a beautiful tune. It's 
it's really good to know and follow the hours of the Holy Pascha because as you follow the, the journey of the Holy Pascha, you start to feel the beauty as it culminates to reach to the Good Friday. And then we reach also to the cross. And as we see the cross, the salvation happens. And then we see the story doesn't end by the cross. So God came to save us and pay the debt of all the sins of everyone. But at the same time, He is a glorious God. He is a victorious God. So the story doesn't end by the death of Christ on the cross. He gets buried after that and then He is resurrected. He had to defeat death because He is a victorious God. So the death has no power or authority over us anymore. And that's how we believe in and that's how we can have hope in salvation. Because when we look at our own sins, we see that we are tending to fall down. We tending to die with the, with the death of sin. But when we see the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, we have hope in His resurrection. So every time you see your sins, know that there is a resurrection there. Through the resurrection, we have faith. Through the resurrection, we have hope that we can get over all of our sins. This is the beauty of the Holy Passion Week. So let's go through the journey together. Let's enjoy it and participate. It was really beautiful to see all the church here tonight singing together the psalm with the tune of, of Bascha. That's how you enjoy the Bascha. If you participate and you become part of the prayers, you feel that you're not stranger to it. You're not here to watch. You're here to participate. And as you participate, you enjoy. And you feel like coming back again. You feel like being part of it all the time. May God give us that strength that we be with Him all the time. And glory be to God forever. Amen.